All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Other Life Podcast, the only podcast in the world dedicated to internet vitalism and indie thinkers exiting institutions, generally overthrowing society as we know it and other uh, related themes. So welcome back. Thank you for coming. And as always, I just want to ask you to subscribe to the YouTube channel and do click that little bell right next to it so you get notifications. And while you're at it, you should subscribe to the podcast on your phone or wherever you get your podcast because yeah, sometimes you don't want to listen to something really long on YouTube. So yeah, subscribe to the podcast and just want to thank everyone for coming out as always. We are now getting back into the swing of having some interesting guests on. I haven't had a live stream guest on for a little while because I've been experimenting with other formats. I've been doing some other things which you might have caught on the channel, but I am uh, very happy to be returning to the the tradition of having really interesting, uh, eccentric, internet-based uh, geniuses and hackers and writers on the podcast to to carry on one of the you know I would say key themes of the the, the first year or two of the Other Life podcast. I want to stay true to that, and so today we are going to be joined by um, someone named Mike. El Elias or Elias should I probably should have checked that with him but uh, as usual I never quite know what to say we'll get we'll get the confirmation from him but his name is Mike and he recently launched a product called ideamarket.io and this is something I've been talking about for a long time I've been super super interested in the possibility of of using blockchains to create markets for truth essentially and this guy has went and tried to do it. And so I love people who are trying to instantiate radical ideas and are really putting in the work to try to build systems that can, you know, fundamentally advance, you know, the human pursuit of, of truth seeking, leveraging the full power of, of technology. So Mike is also a writer and that's why I was especially keen to have him on the podcast. Cause he's a true, he's a truth thinker. He's been writing for places like ribbon farm and on different websites. And I think his, his own blog and on Twitter, uh, so he, he's a true thinker, a true first principles kind of guy who's been developing ideas around the nature of truth and, na and the nature of facts and the potential for truth or idea markets for a long time. So he's just a genuine, really smart dude, genuine thinker and, and a real hustler and hacker himself who's, who's really trying to put into practice the ideas that he's developing. So I'm very excited to have Mike on today and to return to the regular flow of live stream podcast interviews with people like Mike. So I'm going to now bring in Mike to the stream and uh, lo and behold, Mike, how are you today? And uh, thanks for joining the podcast. Great pleasure. I'm very well. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Yeah, you got it. What, what was it, by the way? Is it Elias or Elias? It's Elias. Elias. Mike Elias of ideamarket.io. Mike, to start things off, would you just give us the elevator pitch, if you will, of ideamarket.io? What is the idea? And in a, in a nutshell, what did you build here? In a nutshell, what I've built is a market to replace corporate media as the arbiter of credibility. Awesome. And tell us a little bit about the underlying mechanics. We have a pretty smart crowd, so you don't have to dumb it down. You can get technical cool. if you want. How, how does how, cool. how did you build this and how does it work? Um, I'll start with how it works briefly. The market is a series of bonding curves. Every token it represents a social media account. So you can list social media accounts like Twitter accounts on a market and they can all basically trade against each other uh, against the same bonding curve. So there's a level playing field. There's always liquidity. And this enables people to sort of collectively decide based on risk, who is worth listening to, what voices are worth amplifying. You could think of it sort of like Reddit, where the upvotes are expensive. It's Reddit with risk-backed upvotes. Only unlike Reddit, there's no sorting algorithms, there's no decay over time, there's no moderators, there's no administrators. Um, and also, it's not granular at the individual piece of content level. It's it's more at the account level for now. It's at the information asset level, as as you might say. So, when you buy one of these expensive upvotes to signal your faith in something, to signal your belief that this deserves attention, this person deserves attention, the money that you spend gets locked in a smart contract and 
at Compound Finance, a uh, decentralized lending protocol. And that uh, deposit earns interest, and the interest gets paid to the owner of the social media account that's named. So on one hand, you have speculation on token price. You have speculation basically on expected future attention worthiness as determined by your peers, as determined by other market participants. And on the back end, you have a passive income stream generated by the sum total of the confidence uh, of the participants in the market. So you have this income stream for creators, for Twitter account owners, for virtually anyone with an audience to fund themselves sheerly by uh, earning the genuine trust of their audience to the point where the audience will actually risk money to support them. Okay, fascinating. So one of the questions that immediately comes to my mind is the way that you frame it is it's this kind of market for, for trust where basically every thinker can have basically a kind of stock listing, just like on the NASDAQ or something like that. And the price associated with that thinker can increase or decrease as the public's trust increase increases or decreases in that person. But one of the things I'm, I'm curious to understand a little bit better is why does this necessarily reflect trust? This particular kind of category or this particular sure. type of, of, of attribute that we call trust. Can it also just reflect uh, people really like this person and they want their stock price to go up? So you have a bunch of fans uh, kind of vote the stock price up. Uh, so how do you, in what way does this really kind of capture trust? I just want to understand that better. Sure. So it captures trust in the sense that when people need it to, it will. Because there's currently no other mechanism for a uh, population to signal its beliefs in a way that is unmoderated by a third party. We have polling companies, media corporations, voting, social media. All of these have uh, involve intermediaries, involve trusted administrators and curators of some kind who may not have the best interests of the public at my, in mind, may have their own uh, opinions, may have uh, bad intentions, whatever, whatever the situation is. Uh, idea market is a way for people to know that their voices are being heard. And I think evidence of this can be seen in the recent GME phenomenon where people risked money to send a message to Wall Street and to America and to sort of have this, this rally and cry of this is, this is how we feel. And we're expressing it in dollars because we care that much about it and you can't stop us. So this is very much in line with what we're trying to do. Only we're allowing people to send this kind of message uh, for any message, for very specific uh, messages and people as opposed to just don't short my stocks and don't don't play around too much. It's just it's it's not confined to what can be expressed by a, a Wall Street stock. Okay. Okay. So basically people could try to abuse idea market in a in a way that pumps up the value of some public figure, but it would be very risky and costly to do that because if it's not reflective of the true underlying value of that public figure's you know, speech, then it's going to drop in the long run. That's yeah, the uh, yeah, that's the idea. In the long run, the the market will serve the needs of of the public and and what people feel needs needs to be heard. Especially as the stakes get higher, as it becomes, uh, as people become more frustrated and less trustful of institutions, and chaos and division increase. Uh, I think we're we're already kind of at a at a fever pitch uh, in that sort of mood, and idea market is an an avenue for the expression and hopefully the resolution of those feelings. All right, all right, it's very very fascinating. And so, walk us through a little bit about how you expect this to play out. Like, what types of social implications should we expect from this? First of all, I noticed that you already have, I think you just launched this week, right? Just a few days ago. And I think it looks like there's already yeah. about a million dollars invested in, in in thinkers basically on this market. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. We launched yesterday and had a, had a wonderful response. And so it's basically that people are, people who trust individual figures, put their own money in. That money is, um, 
earning interest on the market through like DeFi yeah, from uh, yeah. apparatus, right? And then yes. some of that money is actually going into the pockets of the figure. All of the interest is going into the pockets of the figure. The deposits right. can be taken back from the investor, from the buyer rather, um, adjusted for profit and loss based on the token price at the moment. Uh, but all of the interest goes right to the, the named person. And so do the do the investors or whatever you call them, do they get anything or no? The buyers are purely speculating. They're buying to uh, to create a signal and indicate a, a preference for I for see. their perspective for people that. But they, they can trust, yeah. they can sell their shares. They can sell at any time, yeah. Unless they lock their tokens, which is something they can choose to do in order to indicate a long term confidence uh, in a particular listing. But that's always optional. I see. Okay. Okay. Fascinating. So. What types of social implications do you expect this to have? It seems like the idea would be that this is going to hopefully encroach on the capacity for public intellectuals to to lie or to be systematically in error over and over again. Is that the idea? So it's like if you're, you know, influential on Twitter, but maybe you have a long history of getting things wrong, right? Then uh, as idea market gains traction and gains, you know, you know liquidity or whatever you want to call it, then it, it, the idea is that those types of people will no longer really receive respect or attention because their price on idea market is either non-existent or very low. Um, it's somewhat like that. Yeah. The idea is to build a, a reckoning mechanism for public influence that if you, if you abuse public trust, if you lose it, there's a rapid way of uh, showing that publicly of signaling that, um, from the public to back to itself. Um, I hope that makes, does that make sense just by itself? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. I think so. Okay, so yeah. walk us through a little bit about how it works as, as a creator or as an, or as a public intellectual, you know, is this the type of thing that, you know, let's say you think you're an underpriced, you know, public intellectual, like, do you put yourself on this market? Do you have to wait for someone else to, yeah. um, how should people think about that? The listings are, are trustless and permissionless, meaning anybody can list anybody else, basically. And if I list, you know, at Jay Murphy on Twitter and you don't know about it and I buy it, the interest will accrue to your wallet anyway until you come and claim it. So you not knowing about it doesn't mean that you can't benefit from it or that you won't uh, still be involved. If you have a Twitter account, you're potentially uh, available to be to be listed here. So. In practice, what let me let me give a little bit of backstory. What inspired right. me here is when I first started trading crypto a few years ago, I had never really taken time to learn how to invest and all how all that works. So when I was learning how to invest and trade and participate in these kind of speculative, risky uh, crypto investments, I would you know go on crypto forums where the secrets would get leaked every now and then. And what struck me about those environments, about those forums, was that everyone was saying, shill me X, tell me what I'm missing. Find me the thing that nobody knows about that is really great. Or alternatively, tell me what's wrong with this really popular thing that everyone thinks is great. Everyone was ferocious about improving their understanding of the crypto landscape and learning about things that they didn't know existed before. And what struck me about this is that in the information age, in the internet age, access to information isn't the problem anymore. It's the desire to learn and improve one's understanding, whatever that might be. And so what I'm attempting to do with Idea Market is to bring the profit motive that inspired that ferocious curiosity in crypto investors to the general public, or at least to people who have a reasonable interest in influencing the public narrative and improving common knowledge. And that's pretty much anybody. Uh, these days, it's most people are feeling frustrated, feeling unheard, feeling like they know better than the mainstream. And uh, I want to give people both an avenue to express that and also an, in, an increased motivation to consider a wide variety of viewpoints so that there might actually be a consensus here. Okay. Okay. Fascinating. Now, one of the reasons I was excited to have you on is because, you know, you're not, 
you're not just one of these people who frequently hits my DMs trying to shill something to my audience, but you're a real thinker. You're a real writer. I've, I've seen you around. Uh, you know, you've written really thoughtful and interesting pieces uh, over quite some time, analyzing precisely these types of, of questions from a more theoretical perspective. And I, so I have a lot of respect for that. And one of the pieces that you that you wrote, uh, which I found quite interesting, well, actually you wrote a, a few pieces about the question of what truth really is and what what facts are. So one of the common ideas you hear about now, which is very popular in this kind of crisis of, of, of social media confusion today, is this idea of fact checking. This is what a lot of the big social media platforms are really investing a lot of effort into, is trying to separate the wheat from the chaff and have various types of, whether it be algorithms or actual human people sorting through different posts and marking the, the true claims from the false claims. I think you have a viewpoint that suggests this is this is just completely doomed, right? Um, so explain to us why these these common initiatives right now to do what is known as fact checking is doomed to failure. Explain, explain your theory of that. Sure. So let's back up a little bit. The, we seem to have forgotten as a society that the, you know, fundamental principles of science, the fundamental principle you might even say is uncertainty that, our goal with science is to improve on existing knowledge and conclusions are tentative. And now that we have an advanced science and institutions that have been relying on it for decades or even centuries, there's this sense of certainty that has crept in. And colloquially, this takes the form of facts. And when, you know, when serious scientists are discussing things, they know that it's just colloquial and they know that it's that in reality, it's tentative. But when uh, institutions are trying to enforce a uh, consensus uh, on the public, they take something that is supposed to be uncertain and pretend that it's certain for the sake of convenience, saying this is a fact, this is something that it is not wise to question anymore or is safe to not question anymore, and then attempts to uh, sort of coerce agreement with that using social pressure and censorship and suppression and uh, all of these other things. So the problem is that certainty is artificial and especially in the case when institutions have done a terrible job uh, discerning, deciding, curating the facts in the past. And there's a lot of suspicion in the air and a lot of good reason for it. Um, people are not so eager to simply eat what they are fed uh, epistemically, and also I just don't I don't think it's it's good for them because it is in a way anti-science to have these crusades based on facts to suppress disagreeing voices to ostracize disagreeing people um, to rule out possibilities on the basis of their apparent outrageousness as opposed to their evidence or lack thereof um, is is poisonous and it's not really it doesn't have anything to do with 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 thinking or uh, consensus making at all it's really uh, just a kind of forceful paternalistic um, failure mode and people feel this people feel the disrespect of this when Facebook says this is fake news they say, who are you to tell me that? And they go elsewhere. Right. And there is simply no convincing people against their will. And these, and I think it's a failure. It's a failure of psychology understanding that uh, there have been, there's been a century of development in propaganda. And after a century of success, people have forgotten, institutions have forgotten that in the end, people can't be convinced against their will. And now they are not willing anymore. You have, they have, the institutions have lost people's trust. And so trying to force conclusions down people's throats just becomes extremely unpalatable. And whatever merit they may have becomes a shame to accept. So uh, it, it makes the truth seeking landscape uh, a pretty treacherous place. Yeah, definitely. Also, it's now easier than ever to basically develop your own theories of the world. I mean, you have uh, tons of outsiders developing pretty sophisticated, not to say correct or true, but sophisticated 
theories of what's of what's actually going on. And you can say whatever you want about how crazy they are, but that's not going to stop them from attracting huge numbers of followers and adherents. So I think what you're saying about the nature of facts is really, really important and significantly underrepresented. Like people, you know, my, my background is in, is in social science. You know, I, I I'm, I'm, I'm a, a social scientist by vocation really. And one of the things you appreciate as a social scientist, I think more than a lot of people is how, uh, even the most seemingly, uh, conventional and obvious undeniable facts about society are always really just hypotheses. There, there really are, there really is no firm ground. There's no kind of atomic unit of certainty about how society works or what society even is or what is going on at any given moment. Uh, e you know, even descriptive statements about, you know, there are X number of people who think this or that. It's all estimates at best. And usually there's some type of uh, hypothesis even involved in what, what seem like the most basic statements about what's going on in the world at any given time. And so you're absolutely right. You know, even what people call facts are really just kind of low level theories or, you know, widely, widely agreed upon uh, theories that have, have a, a wide, you know, degree of, of public investment, but they are ultimately theories. And, and th this kind of drive to codify facts at the level of social media platforms, essentially the, pub the public sphere is actually not just doomed, but it's also kind of scary, really. You wrote about this, I believe, right? It, if you actually follow that through, it has kind of uh, disastrous and alarming, rather frightening implications because it, it almost dooms us to have an Orwellian situation where you have these kind of boards that are defining what is the case and what is not the case. And no matter how objective that is, no matter how, how honest that they try to do that, it's going to be it's going to be a, a kind of author, a, a hellish authoritarian dynamic simply because of this fact that you're, you're pointing out that, or you see what I'm saying, the fact, uh, this, this idea or this hypothesis you're presenting, which is quite compelling, which is that facts are themselves essentially just low level theories. And when you're instituting them or enforcing them, uh, you, you pretty much have this dogmatic reign of, of anti-scientific, uh, legislation essentially. Yeah, absolutely. To the extent that facts are treated as uh, as certainties or as uh, something that is presumed dangerous to question or safe to not question, they they corrupt. To the extent that we feel certain about something, we feel justified in in pushing away anything that disagrees. And in the same way that you know power corrupts certainty corrupts in that same sort of way. So to the extent that we rely on a get the facts and then enforce them sort of approach, um, it's not going to work. It's, it's going to be very counterproductive. Okay. And so you built this system that pretty much gives public intellectuals a kind of stock price and allows that to fluctuate on the open market. And the, the, the intellectuals themselves who are represented on this, on this stock market, if you will, actually see the upside of their 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 stock price rising and what something i'm curious where does idea how does idea market make money where does that sure. come in so in a couple of ways one we make a trading fee on the on the transactions that occur on the okay, protocol. transaction fees yeah however that's sort of a short-term hack that's to keep us afloat for now while we're still building it ultimately we want to give the community the users control of the governance of the protocol and we want to back out and not have uh, the powers that administrators typically have. Um, so at a certain point that income stream may change because the community may not want to just pay me and my boys from the whole protocol's transaction stream. So the transaction fee is one income stream and also the way compound is governed is they uh, release tokens, their platform token, the COP token, gradually to people who use the Compound platform in proportion to their deposits. So we are a protocol, a whole protocol that plugs right into Compound. So all of the money that gets deposited uh, in Idea Market earns interest for the account holders, but also earns COP tokens for us, for uh, my company that built the protocol. So that's another income stream. 
uh, that we're going to be using to build and move the protocol forward until we give it to the community. And um, that's that's how we make money for now. Okay, cool. I was just kind of curious about that. So do you see, how should people think about this as an opportunity if, you, if you're a creator or an intellectual? Like, a, you know, yeah. maybe you're not an Elon Musk, but maybe you think you're, you're an underpriced, you know, public intellectual uh, whose who's stock price is likely to, to rise. And uh, how do you see this playing out? Do you see people, you know, doing little like self IPOs or something like that, where you like put yourself on this place and then you kind of rally, you rally your fans, you rally investors. Uh, is that, is that how you think people should be thinking about this? Would you warn people to not think about it that way? Or um, how would you, how would you tell people to think about this as an opportunity if they are themselves creators or intellectuals who want to kind of get themselves into this type of market? Sure. So I think one of the most promising avenues is for people like journalists who are doing excellent work and uncovering important realities, but making their living from paywalls have the biggest opportunity here because a paywall kind of is, is, is necessary for survival right now for journalists, but it goes against their ultimate goal, which is to give the best information to the greatest number of people. Right. So idea market incentivizes you for growing your audience, for releasing your content for free, while giving you an income stream in proportion to the trust that you earn from that audience that has free access to your material. So I'm excited to see what kinds of journalists who typically have a paywall model or any other content producers that have that sort of a model uh, who decide to make their content free, release it to a wider audience, and use Idea Market as their primary income stream. Right, right. Now, okay, all right. And so that the money that is earned by the creator, that goes, that's not locked up. That goes directly into like a bank account. Um, it goes into their crypto wallet, but yeah, it's immediately in their ownership. Right. Uh, it, it, it's, it's intended to be pure gravy. Yeah. Okay. It's fascinating. Very fascinating. So, so this is the type of, do you, now what about people who are, are, does this require a kind of significant public audience first, or, you know, can you, if you, maybe no one knows who you are, but you have a handful of, of backers or supporters, is this something you can, you can kind of organize an IPO for yourself or am I thinking about it the wrong way? I suppose in theory you could, though I would advise against hype and, and rallying for a, vi a variety of reasons. But what I'm excited about is the, um, the micro cap effect. The idea that when you're looking to make big returns on an investment, you're looking at the risky things, the tiny things, the new things, the overlooked things, the underpriced things, the secret things. And that means when you're new and you get listed on Idea Market, and if you just have you know a few of your fans lift the price off zero, or maybe even if you don't, uh, there will be profit hunters looking for the quality material at that level of, uh, of ranking. They're going to be looking for things that are currently low and new and unknown on the market, but they, which they perceive to have a great overall potential in the, in the larger market. And because that's the most attractive speculative investment. So the, the vision here is that when the market is mature enough that there is this constant stream of profit hunters scouting the bottom looking for something that's potentially good that it provides a very easy and sort of automatic way for uh, quality content producers to gain a, a large audience and an income stream without a whole lot of effort. They put it on the market and people are hunting it out. They investigate. They're taking it seriously because it's a profit opportunity and uh, giving a, an honest attempt to understand the value of what you're creating. And if they discover that, they'll buy it up and, and open it up to a uh, less risk-prone stratum of the market. And this process will sort of repeat. So uh, the audience sort of grows itself on the basis of, of speculative possibility. And so it's really um, uh, a meritocracy, but a very patient one. It, it waits for waits for the mood to 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 strike and recognize you okay yeah that's it's absolutely fascinating I'm, I'm super intrigued and i'm definitely going to 
get myself on there at some point if if someone else doesn't put me on there first. I think I'm, I'm probably going to wait for the gas fees to go down a little bit. Uh, everything's really expensive on Ethereum right now. But uh, so, okay, fa yeah. So are, what else in the world of crypto slash creator economy do you find most interesting or exciting right now? This has become a, a, a hot topic on, on, on in my work lately and in the podcast lately. I'm, I'm super excited by the way that uh, crypto is intersecting with uh, creator economy innovations. What do you see that's most interesting or exciting to you? Just curious. Sure. Um, I have to admit to a fair amount of tunnel vision in recent months and, and oh, not sure. being incredibly educated on what's what's going on. But one of my favorite things uh, right now is rabbit hole. Rabbithole.gg is the website. And if you yeah, haven't heard that. of this. Break yeah? it down to me. I, I'm not sure I, sure I follow it completely. I'd love to learn more. Okay, so it's kind of like a decentralized version of Coinbase Earn. And Coinbase Earn is a program, not a program, it's a feature on Coinbase that invites people to learn about a particular crypto asset and take a little quiz to show that they've learned it. And as a result, they get a little reward denominated in that crypto asset. So Rabbit Hole is kind of a protocol for creating uh, little educational programs or participatory programs, at the end of which you get a little reward. So similar to Idea Market, it's paying people to learn something, uh, but in a much more direct and specified way. And I think there could be implications for the future of credentialing here and education, certification, uh, all kinds of things. I think uh, there's I think there's a lot of a lot of potential here. And so is this is this live now? Can you use it and what can you do with it or do on it? I believe it is it is live and it's in its early stages. I think the way they've launched is they have a couple of partnerships with other uh, crypto protocols that have uh, given them tokens or something to reward their users with. And also, uh, please forgive me, rabbit hole founders, if I'm messing this up. It's I, I, it's been a while. Um, but uh, yeah, they're 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 starting by partnering with other uh, protocols to incentivize people to learn about those protocols, and that makes sense from a from a uh, you know market entry uh, perspective to me got it okay yeah it's fascinating i've seen that around a little bit are you paying much attention to this explosion in nft auctions that artists artists are doing and making in some cases huge sums of money launching non-fungible tokens of artwork are you are you watching this and do you see that do you think this is here to stay is this kind of a fad or is this um as significant as it appears to be by the numbers it's hard not to see the activity that's going on. So it's definitely been on my radar. And I'm really glad that artists are getting value and finding new ways to monetize and build their audience. And I have to admit that I don't quite understand the value proposition uh, the way the rest of the space seems to. I don't really, I'm not understanding uh, what unifies these things or what sort of standard against which they're being measured. Um, if it's if it's something, I've heard of NFTs sometimes being described as like virtual Pokemon cards or baseball cards, and that sort of makes sense. Only the value of a baseball card often comes from, you know, whether it's autographed or in good physical condition or came from the right year or has a fragment of a baseball bat or a used jersey in it. Um, and with NFTs, especially if it's an NFT of an artwork, of a, of a visual artwork, I really don't understand what value is in owning something that I can view for free and get exactly all of the same value out of. And it's not like on my computer I have Picasso's molecules in the canvas still. It's not like the signature of a great artist is in there on the one that you own any more than it is on the one that you see for free. So there are aspects of the NFT craze right now that I 100% don't understand. And that would be one of them. Okay. That's, that's delicately put. I, I, I see the, the, the question there and it is a little bit vexing. I, I think a lot of people f could say the same about crypto in general, right? There's always this kind of vexing, puzzle at the at, at the bottom of right like what makes bitcoin valuable uh, yeah and please please educate me because i just feel i feel you know kind of wandering in the dark on this issue oh like, no what, i mean what, I'm, is, I'm what does everyone NFT, know that i don't i'm watching the nft space explode and i'm i'm very interested for the obvious reason just that 
there are now many cases of artists making huge yeah. sums of money launching NFT auctions. And so it's just intrinsically interesting and attention worthy, I think, if you're a creator on the internet. So I'm, I'm definitely watching with interest. I don't have strong priors, really. I'm, that's why I'm kind of curious what other people think about it. Uh, I'm, I'd I'm, like to throw no, in I'm something sure. positive I mean, here. I didn't, I didn't mean to act to, you know, somewhat rip on the industry there, but I'd, I'd like to share just one thing that I really do like about the NFT space. Yeah. And that is uh, the perpetual auction functionality invented by Simon de la Rivier, where you can have a piece of artwork that's always on sale and the buyer sets a price and then pays a tax on that price. And if anyone else pays that, you know, set price, then it automatically becomes theirs. And the original artist gets that tax that was you know, paid to set the sell price. So I think there's a lot of incredibly clever uh, royalty related, attribution related uh, mechanics and interesting things you can build into NFTs. Uh, so I, I do think there's a lot of promise in, in, in that concept. I just think it might be elsewhere. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally see what you're saying. I, I think it's all very interesting and intellectually, I think, I think it's quite, it's, it's quite vexing and, and fascinating because a lot of the use cases in crypto that do seem to be working in the sense that they are attracting, you know, real buyers and sellers do at the core of them often have a kind of vexing, vexing nature to them. I mean, you could say the same thing about, about Bitcoin, right? That, uh, you know, there's some, it seems, it seems to me that, I mean, my read on it anyway, is that, uh, blockchains are really forcing us to reckon with some of the underlying paradoxes of the nature of value in general. So it's like Bitcoin seems to be stable and sustainable. And, uh, it does, it does seem to be a hard asset that is here to stay. And yet there is at the core of it, this kind of you know, social reality that things are valuable because other people believe they're valuable. But nonetheless, you can you can nonetheless instantiate that technically in a way that functions sustainably and 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 grows in value over time. Uh, it seems that NFTs might be something similar, where you know you look at it at first glance and it's like, um, who wants to just own a digital signature? There, there's no value in this digital signature, and anyone can see the work of art. So you're not really owning the work of art. This makes no sense. Why would people pay so much money just to have this digital signature? Um, but then you start to think, well, maybe that was always at the core of what baseball cards were anyway, right? And uh, But perhaps to a degree that we never fully appreciated until it became kind of technically instantiated in this in this radically purified way. So I, 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 I find this to be one of the kind of most in intellectually interesting questions related to uh, you know these burgeoning spaces. Yeah, I would. I've I've never thought of it that way, and that's interesting. I I would love to see more patterns in this sort of primordial chaos that the NFT space seems to be in right now. And I I don't mean that disparagingly, but rather just a comment on the sort of lack of pattern or standardization. Um, yeah, I just I, I I look forward to seeing what sort of forms emerge, what sort of uh, what sort of distinct patterns and behaviors and, and uses emerge. Right. So we actually have a good question here from auto agent. And the question is essentially just because idea market indexes the, the intellectuals on it through their handles on some other social media platform. What if they were to get deplatformed from the initial social media platform? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Or are you thinking about how to handle that in the future? Sure. So there are two parts to this. One is we are not married to any particular platform. I chose Twitter as one of our opening ones for a variety of reasons, but we, uh, I like to think of us as chain link for public narratives. No matter what platform is the public square right now, we can plug in and allow people to express their beliefs and, and rank content with these risk weighted upvotes. Um, so if a, if a platform betrays you, there are, there are others. But I think the more pertinent answer is that one of the reasons we built a market uh, as this solution is it respects the fact that we don't have control over what platforms do. And if Jack wants to remove your favorite person, that's simply a risk that you have to take as a buyer and that they have to take as a listed person. Um, so there, it, the market 
is designed to refrain from interfering in, in buying decisions so that people can consider criteria like deplatforming risk uh, to whatever extent they prefer. Okay, so so basically you just, you just bite the bullet on that and say if they were to get removed from Twitter, their their stock price would go down because of it, that. It, uh, it makes absolute sense that it would. I don't really see what other what other re reaction could take place unless there was some sort of decentralized backup. And even in that case, I don't know how we would link the original listing to it. But uh, yeah. the, the, the point is, it's a market. There are risks in markets, right. and it's the investor's uh, privilege of, of deciding how to treat them. So I'm sure this isn't, you know, on the immediate roadmap or anything. But could you imagine a, a long-term future if idea market were to continue to to grow and to and to succeed? You couldn't you imagine a situation where it's like you have a a, a validated kind of personal account that links all of the other accounts. So it's like if you're on Twitter and you have a Substack and you have a YouTube, they're all you you have like one um, validated like entity or user on this account. And so one of them could go down or be deplatformed and the other, the other could stay. I mean, in the long run, you could even yeah. imagine, you know, having, having as your kind of uh, fail proof uh, bedrock account, some kind of like basic blog on a blockchain that is uh, technically censorship proof as, as the, as the kind of your platform of last resort. Right. So that, if you're really bullish on someone, they could they could be kicked off of any, all the platforms in the world, but you're confident that they're going to keep keep producing uh, value on at least that one that that one uh, kind of bedrock, you know, last resort platform or something like that. Yeah, we're definitely interested in tying various accounts together belonging to the same person. We want to do that absolutely. And in terms of you know migrating uh, more to more secure, uncensorable platforms and dns and all of that it seems like just on a technical technological basis things will naturally gravitate in that direction and we're there for it nice okay can i make a, a feature request that i think would be really cool you can tell me what or you can By shoot this means. down no i you love can, this is my favorite this is my favorite thing if, if there's some reason it wouldn't work but what i think would be a, a great addition to idm market is uh, maybe some kind of browser plugin that lays over Twitter. Oh, so, I love when people say the ideas that are, are already next plans. You already we think built about a that. prototype okay. of this. Oh, baby, let me let me tell you about the browser extension. I love this thing. Because something I, something I think about a lot is like I think to to really accelerate the the power of idea market, you would want people to kind of feel ashamed if they don't have this near their name, right? So, in an ideal world, you want this to be like um, a badge of honor. So on your Twitter profile, like you want other people who are with, you know, this advanced technology who, who are really with it. You want them to be able to see on your Twitter profile, you know, what your stock price is. And, and if, and we want to get to a point where you check out someone's Twitter profile and they don't even have a stock price, you know, they're just fakers, they're posers, you know, and then you just like, Psh, I'm not following these people. Precisely. Precisely. One of our big midterm goals is basically to relieve social media platforms of the responsibility of most content moderation. Because as soon as every trusted voice has a, a certain price level in idea market, the cost of creating fake news or utterly fabricated things is going to go from basically zero to whatever it costs to put oneself in that echelon. Um, so there, it raises the bar to convincing this uh, gradually and, and, and infinitely. So that's absolutely the direction we're going in. It's our, it's a very next step sort of thing that we're going to do. We want this to penetrate the whole internet and take the responsibility of content moderation, censorship, epistemic decisions off of the shoulders of trusted third parties and into the hands of the public. Right now, do you see this? Could you imagine in the long term that if this were to take off, what, would you imagine a whole financial infrastructure to emerge around this, right? So this is a kind of initial proof of concept, but do you imagine a, a future where there's like derivatives on, you know, public intellectuals and hedge funds and all of this kind of stuff organized around yeah. uh, like the, these, these, these securities essentially in public figures and thinkers. Is that, is, is that, do you really, where do you give us a picture, paint a picture I of can, like where this, where I can hardly yeah. think of a more promising future than one in which our attention is managed with as much care and diligence as our money. 
when our uh, attention and, and hedge funds and whatnot are devoting all of their tools and sophistication to identifying obscure genius and correcting deceit and and illuminating truth out of their own self-interest in, in whatever way that may look, I think that's a very promising and anti-fragile future. So I'm, I would love for that to take place on a macro scale. And um, there's a second part to this also, which is to the extent that infrastructure is built around idea market, the the nature, the, the, the whole the whole process that I'm that I'm hoping to to set in motion here, accelerates with infrastructure like um, indicators. Like who's who's going to invent the Bollinger Bands of idea markets? Who's going to discover the signal in this noise? Every time there becomes some new way to identify, uh, to discern trustworthiness or attention worthiness or value or truth or honesty or its lack, its absence uh, in a person, in a listing, in a piece of information, that strategy can then be applied sort of universally to accelerate the rate of future discernment and future recognition. So as tools get built for discovery of this new asset class, I think things are going to get really interesting and I'm very excited. Yeah, I like the idea of of maybe trying to become like uh like like a VC for you know ideas. That's an interesting prospect, right? Because let's say you you consider yourself a connoisseur of you know the weird dark corners of the internet. Like you know, I I, I sometimes quite enjoy myself. You know, you could guilty, guilty. Yeah, you could you you could basically you know you find some Twitter account that's like six months old, but you're like this person is spitting fire. This is a genius. Yeah iconoclastic rising account and I'm going to make I'm gonna put them on idea market. I'm going to buy some of this stock and you could, you could basically imagine building a whole portfolio of kind of seed stage intellectuals that you, you buy up and it's, it, that's absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. That's 100% the vision. I can feel, I can feel you wanting to do what I want to do. That's, that's exactly it. Yeah. So when do you think when do you think gas fees are going to go down? Do you, are you bullish on Ethereum too? Is this like going to happen soon, or are you, do you pay close attention to this, or what? I pay whatever attention I can as a non technical founder. It is thoroughly uh, not my purview. Oh right, you're not a developer. However, yeah. okay, sure. Right. Um, however, our smart contracts are very gas efficient already. The fact that the uh, fees are so high is just a testament to how congested the networks are. Yeah, there are a number of layer twos and other kinds of scaling solutions being presented all the time. And there are only a couple of requirements that those need to meet in order to work for us. And I'm happy to integrate them as soon as they become feasible, because, yeah, absolutely. The gas fees are prohibitive right now. We want everyday people to be able to buy small amounts and just throw change in there. And uh, so, yeah, that, that's that's a high, a high priority that we that we look forward to a better situation with. Yeah, and I look forward to I look forward to playing with it for sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely test out some of the ideas I'm 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 saying here. Like it's, it's especially interesting if you if you if you produce media uh, a, that happens to be kind of in the niche of 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 internet thinkers and, and and public intellectuals because I'm already kind of imagining like I could like so someone like me I could basically if I find someone who I think is like severely undervalued. I could buy a bunch of their stock basically and then bring them on the podcast and like boost them uh, as much yes. as possible. Right. Yes, you could. And <laughs> yes. And then that it's would have implications for your own token as well. That would have implications for your own listing. If you made your followers money by doing that, that would have implications for your income potentially. Right. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. So I, I definitely love the idea I've I've been you know thinking about this and talking about this general concept for quite a while and and kind of hoping that this would come and and it looks like you've 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 uh, taken a very good stab at it so I'm definitely rooting for IdeaMarket.io I, I I would love to see you folks succeed and uh, yeah I think we're coming up on the hour now so I don't want to I don't want to take up too much of your time we covered a lot of ground and I think uh, I'm I'm glad you shared it with our audience I think a lot of people in my audience are quite interested and will be quite intrigued to, to check it out and to play with it. But um, 
what do you think? Was there anything else you were eager to, you know, get on the agenda or anything you wanted to ask me or, 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 or talk to me about before I let you go for the day? Yeah, I would like to ask you what sorts of unexpected things you might be particularly long or short on. Ideas, people, trends, what what kind of surprising idea market type uh, tips might you have? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I have a pretty strong thesis on community and the nature of community moving forward. You know, I'm, I agree with a lot of your theoretical writings about the, you know, the, the, the fundamental, um, you know, tenuousness of, of, of what are called facts. And I do think that we are going into an era right now where reality itself is, is increasingly fragmenting and, and forking. I've, I've written a bit about this where I think just the, the, the fundamental nature of social reality is now kind of being hacked to a degree that it's never been so, so explicitly hacked. And I think the most profound and forward thinking uh, thinkers and creators are essentially the people who are who have the most advanced understanding of, of this reality forking phenomenon taking place. And so what is called the content creator is, is a kind of ridiculously, you know, defanged euphemism for what's really going on. The, 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 the really impressive and, and, and truly avant garde content creators are really a kind of reality entrepreneurs who are hack or kind of hacking the source code of, of society to it, to some sense. And they and everyone is scrambling for their own, you know, pocket, their own, their own patch of, of social reality. And they're, and they're basically anointing themselves Kings of, of their own little fiefdoms. I, I think that this is essentially what's happening with what is again, very euphemistically called the creator economy. And then I think what is also euphemistically called quote unquote community is increasingly a kind of political community that is uh, wrapped around the content creators more or less. And so I think the the emergence uh, and kind of proliferation of online communities is being extremely underestimated and it's kind of its gravity and its political significance and where, where that really shakes out in the long run. So where my mind goes on this and what I'm kind of most interested in is how it seems to me that uh, crypto is increasingly providing this highly fluid and liquid kind of um, uh, infrastructure whereby these content creator led communities are going to essentially uh, break off into their own polities with their own now for the first time ever, thanks to crypto with their own kind of unified autonomous uh, economic infrastructure. And so this is why I'm very interested in the NFTs. I'm very interested in, uh, in, in, in social tokens. Also the, the ERC 20 tokens, because you can essentially have your own currency and your own form, your, your own kind of internal measure of value. And, and to me, what, what, what this really points to is you're going to have essentially small businesses, which are like small governments, which are like small societies where the employees and the owners and the customers are all pretty much the same group kind of taking turns doing those three things. And that is going to be increasingly like autonomous uh, societies basically. And that's that's where I think all this is going. And, and I think that this is one of the reasons why I'm so interested in, in you know, uh, crypto and, and the concept of idea markets in particular, you know, it's like the, what are these different communities going to be competing around? And it's like, there's one future in which they're competing around popularity and kind of, you know, the vapid traditional metrics of, you know, basically vanity and celebrity, but I'm more hopeful that we can do something much more sophisticated to the degree that we're able to, uh, kind of like technologically measure and map the actual kind of veracity of different like theoretical schools. So, so this is where it links up with idea markets and, and idea market.io, because if we get this kind of infrastructure that you're building working, then we can imagine uh, robust autonomous communities that are actually competitively aligned around truth seeking. And that's what I'm most interested in. Uh, but I think a few things have to be developed to get there. But I think idea, idea market .io would be would be one of the one of the steps that would have to be developed, which is why I'm so kind of interested in what you're building. That's awesome. That's 
there was there was a lot there. That, yeah, sorry, that was a bit of a no, 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 a, not not a complaint. I wanted to say yes. there was Very a well. lot in there that I really really liked, and um, it also sounded like some of what you were describing the owner creator, customer, employee, kind of all into one uh, society. Right. People don't like to say this, but isn't that kind of the definition of communism? Which I don't have a problem with. I personally do not have a problem with. If it's something that's cool and works, Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's that's a curse. That's a, that's a bad word. That's a bad word. But technically, I think that's communism. Dude, totally. Absolutely. I'm, yeah. I'm completely with that. Like, I think pretty much all forms of communism that I've ever been tried are disasters and I, I you know i'm no i'm no fan or cheerleader of pretty much anything that passed for quote unquote communism in the 20th century it was almost without without you know uh exception a, a horror show uh but i absolutely agree and I, i've written about this a little bit actually that i do think where all this points in the long run is in a weird way it brings us to kind of what was the initial dream of of people like marx of you know this genuinely kind of disalienated uh society where, um, you know, value flows fluidly and fairly without the kind of exploitation of, of, of middlemen basically. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I would like to, to tie one last thing, uh, together. Cause I, you asked, you asked my opinion about why I think fact checking will fail. I feel like I didn't do a good job explaining what a what a replacement for that like what okay, to do instead great. Yeah, please. like anyone can complain but what to do instead and idea market is is an instantiation of what i think is much better than fact crusading and that is risk management taleb in skin in the game said rationality is risk management and i thought i love that for several reasons one there's no thinking uh, there, there's no there's no decision making in the real world that does not have its attendant risks and rewards. And if you don't factor in the emotional uh, costs and motives of reasoning when there's something to lose or gain, uh, your thinking is in vain. Your rationality is in vain because rationality goes right out the window if the conclusions disagree too much with your per, per, uh, preferred beliefs or political or religious views or whatever. That rationality is very much a subject of the of of the passions, as David Hume would say, subject to the passions. That the the emotions predetermine the conclusion. The rationality usually justifies the conclusion. And risk management, I think, as a philosophy, is an antidote to this. It requires factoring in uh, emotional considerations and and intimate realities in the process of thinking. And that's why I think that the relationship to truth that risk management represents is much healthier and more flexible and organic than this sort of find the facts and then reproduce and disseminate and enforce. So yeah. that's, that's, that's the replacement. Yeah, absolutely. It's like think it's like thinking about the truth as a portfolio of bets, basically. That, exactly, because yeah. that's what they are. That's every that's right. time you believe something, you're betting that I will benefit more from believing this than an alternative. Every single bet, no matter what, even if you don't codify it that way, is implicitly that kind of a decision. So I think uh, thinking about rationality and public narratives in terms of risk management enables us not only to capture all of the best qualities from the edges and bring them up, but also to be aware of all the competing hypotheses so that if uh, evidence for one in particular starts to boil, uh, build up, we don't have to spend time shaking ourselves out of shock and disbelief. It's right there. We've always known it was a possibility. Uh, it really makes uh, societies and people who think this way resilient and sensitive and responsive to all the nuances and demands that the surprise of life and history require. Totally. Very well put. Well, that, I think that's as good a parting thought as any. Thank you for, for, for sharing that last thought. This was a really interesting conversation. And like I said, I'm, I'm, I, I would love to see idea market really take off. So 
I'm definitely rooting for you guys. And uh, if there's any, ever anything I can do to help, let me know. But I just want to thank, thank you for you so your time much. and thank you for coming on and talking about these these ideas. And uh, yeah, I, I appreciate what you're trying to do. Great pleasure. I'll see you on Twitter. Yep. See you around. So people can follow Mike on Twitter and you should go check out Idea Market at ideamarket.io. There's some links in the show notes so people can check that out. I'm sure I'm sure Mike will be happy to receive your DMs too if you want to uh, you know pick his brain Always. about any any of this. Always. He's a, a thoughtful writer and a, and a good internet citizen. So uh, thanks again, Mike. It's been a pleasure and I'll, 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 I'll stay in touch with you. I'll be, I'll be watching closely how idea market unfolds and, and I'll, 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 I'm sure I'll get on there myself quite soon eventually. Thanks so much. Let me know. All right, Mike, take it easy. Bye-bye. All right, everybody, other life podcast. If you haven't already subscribe to the channel and uh, please go ahead and click the bell right next to it so that um, you get notifications whenever I go live and also subscribe to the other life podcast on your phone. So you can listen to this later and you can listen to all the other, you know, past and future podcasts at your convenience instead of, uh, you know, being stuck on YouTube. So thanks for, thanks for coming out everyone. As always, I hope you enjoyed that and all right, I'll be back on here soon, but for now, good evening. See you later.